गाइस पीटीई प्रडिक्शन अपडेट कम्स एवरी वीक विद न्यू क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम विच नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट क्वेश्चन रिपीट इन द रियल एग्जाम सो इट इज़ नॉट पॉसिबल फॉर मी टू एड दीज क्वेश्चन इन अ सॉफ्टवेयर दैन मेक वीडियोज आफ्टर रिकॉर्डिंग इट बिकॉज इट इज मच टाइम कंज्यूमिंग अंटिल आई मेक अ वीडियोज ऑफ वीकली प्रडिक्शन अ वीक विल पास एंड अ न्यू अपडेट विल कम आई एम सेंग दिस बाई माई ओन एक्सपीरियंस सो फ्रॉम नाउ I have started uploading direct questions and answers. You guys just listen to that audios and go through all fill-ups, reorders, etc. along with their answers. You will get the same questions in your exam. One more thing guys, I get this material paid by every week. So it is requested to you to please like, comment and share my videos to motivate me and please subscribe to my channel so that I can continue provide you predictions every week. Thank you guys. Now let's start the video. Ready to start. 3 2 1 One of the social issues faced by the state of Alaska is the lack of mental and emotional well-being of the native Alaskans. It is very unfortunate that many of the Native Americans are living under poor conditions throughout the country. In the cases of Native Alaskans, even virtually entire villages are suffering from a lack of mental and emotional well-being, which includes continuing poor physical and mental health. Alcohol abuse, domestic violence, homicides, and suicides are frequent among them, which of course, lead to families falling apart. It is tragic to see that many children are abused and not educated properly. As a matter of fact, the children themselves are abusing alcohol and other chemicals, and the rate is increasing over the time. Since parents are suffering from mental illnesses and alcohol abuse, they can't take care of their children, so many children are being taken care of by others or simply neglected. Therefore, we can conclude that Alaskan natives are losing hold of their communities, cultural identities and most importantly their childhoods so you can see how serious the issue is plus rather than making a living for themselves they are depending on public services and subsidies they have lost control of and responsibility for their economy and governing institutions But you can see from the relatively crooked and narrow streets of the city of Rome as they look from above today, you can see that again, the city grew in a fairly ad hoc way, as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once. It just grew up over time, beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting. Because what we know about the Romans is when they were left to their own devices and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They, they structured it in a, in a very care, very methodical way. That was basically based on military strategy, military planning. The Romans they couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise. And they everywhere they went on their various campaigns, their various military campaigns, they would build, build camps and those camps were always laid out in a very geometric plan along a grid, usually square or rectangular.
For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark – boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world – they are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. A lot of boys decide early on that they are just too cool for school which means they're more likely to be rowdy in class. Teachers mark them down for this. In anonymous tests, boys perform better. In fact, the gender gap in reading drops by a third when teachers don't know the gender of the pupil they are marking. So what can be done to close this gap? Getting boys to do more homework and cut down on screen time would help. But most of all, abandoning gender stereotypes would benefit all students. Boys in countries with the best schools read much better than girls. And girls in Shanghai excel in mathematics. They outperform boys from anywhere else in the world. Frogs are a diverse and largely carnivorous group of short-bodied, tailless amphibians composing the order Inura. The oldest fossil proto-frog appeared in the early Triassic of Madagascar, but molecular clock dating suggests their origins may extend further back to the Permian, 265 million years ago. Frogs are widely distributed, ranging from the tropics to subarctic regions, but the greatest concentration of species diversity is found in tropical rainforests. There are approximately 4,800 recorded species, accounting for over 85% of extant amphibian species. They are also one of the five most diverse vertebrate orders. Besides living in fresh water and on dry land, the adults of some species are adapted for living underground or in trees. Adult frogs generally have a carnivorous diet consisting of small invertebrates, but omnivorous species exist and a few feed on fruit. Frogs are extremely efficient at converting what they eat into body mass. They are an important food source for predators and part of the food web dynamics of many of the world's ecosystems. The skin is semi-permeable, making them susceptible to dehydration, so they either live in moist places or have special adaptations to deal with dry habitats. Frogs produce a wide range of vocalizations, particularly in their breeding season, and exhibit many different kinds of complex behaviors to attract mates, to fend off predators and to generally survive. Frog populations have declined significantly since the 1950s. More than one-third of species are considered to be threatened with extinction and over 120 are believed to have become extinct since the 1980s. The number of malformations among frogs is on the rise and an emerging fungal disease, chytridiomycosis, has spread around the world. Conservation biologists are working to understand the causes of these problems and to resolve them. Frogs are valued as food by humans and also have many cultural roles in literature, symbolism and religion.
There comes a time in a desert ant's life when a piece of food is too large to ignore, but too heavy to lift, and the only way to get it home is to adopt a new style of walking. The long-legged and speedy Cataglyphus fortis normally covers ground with a three-legged stride that moves two legs forwards on one side, and one on the other. For the next step, the insect mirrors the move with its other three legs. But recordings of ants in the Tunisian desert reveal that when faced with oversized lumps of food ten times their own weight, the forward tripod walking style is abandoned. Unable to lift the morsels in their mandibles, the ants drag the food backwards instead, moving all six legs independently. This is the first time we have seen this in any ants, said lead author Sarah Pfeffer at the University of Ulm in Germany. The ants' long legs already help keep their bodies away from the scorching desert floor and enable them to speed around at up to 60 cm per second. Think of Usain Bolt, who has very long legs compared to body size. The desert floor is also very hot, so the further away their bodies are from the surface, the better, said co-author Matthias Whitlinger. The ants have also evolved to function at body temperatures of 50 C in a desert where temperatures can soar to 70 C. They're basically just trying to get out of the heat, he added. Most Americans take energy for granted. But, for many families, maintaining access to reliable and affordable energy is a persistent challenge and a significant material hardship. This is a problem referred to as energy insecurity, and it affects millions of American households each year. We have found that energy insecurity is a growing and vexing problem among low income households, and the COVID 19 pandemic has made this problem worse. Our analysis finds that, that there are disparities in rates of energy insecurity across various socio-demographic groups. Black and Hispanic households, for example, are significantly more likely to experience energy insecurity and face utility disconnection than white households. So too are households with young children, individuals that require electronic medical devices, and those in dwellings with inefficient or poor conditions. Households that cannot pay for energy are unable to power electronic learning or medical devices, keep perishable, healthy food in the refrigerator, or maintain safe body temperatures. Under conditions of extreme heat or cold, people can suffer from mental and physical health consequences, including the possibility of death. Strategies for coping with uncomfortable temperatures, such as burning trash or sitting in one's car with the heat running, can lead to tragic outcomes as well. Our research underscores the importance of public policy that targets energy insecurity and its underlying causes. Weatherization assistance, incentives for residential solar power, energy bill assistance, and utility disconnection protections are all viable strategies for helping the millions of households across the country that are currently unable to pay their energy bills.
So the pace, at which human minds have evolved over the last half million years and more recently the last 200,000 years, has been so frighteningly rapid that the evolution of cognitive function and perception can only occur in a small number of genes. If one needed to adapt dozens of genes changes in concert, in order to acquire the penetrating minds that we now have, which our ancestors 5,000 years ago didn't have, the evolution could not have taken place, it could not have occurred so quickly. And for that reason alone, one begins to really suspect that the genetic differences between people who lived 5,000 years ago is evidence that the difference between their cognitive functions and ours is not actually as large. Therefore, a rather small number of genes may be responsible for the powerful minds that humans have which most of us now possess. You might think that most of the patients at sleep clinics are being treated for sleeplessness, commonly referred to as insomnia, but that is not the case. The majority of sleep clinic patients suffer from disorders of excessive sleep, or hypersomnia. While most insomniacs somehow manage to drag themselves through the day and function at acceptable, although not optimal levels, this is not so for people who suffer from hypersomnia. They are incapacitated by irresistible urges to sleep during the day, often in inappropriate situations at business meetings, in supermarkets, or at parties. Even more dangerous is their failure to remain awake when driving or operating machinery. Falling asleep in such situations could obviously be life-threatening. Many hypersomniacs suffer from narcolepsy, for which the primary symptom is excessive daytime sleepiness. Though not apparent in childhood, this symptom most often appears for the first time during the teen years and continues throughout a person's life. The sleep attacks may occur as many as 15 to 20 times during the course of the day and last for periods from 15 minutes up to 2 hours. What can be done to help those suffering from narcolepsy? There are certain drugs that can help, and specialists suggest voluntary napping to decrease the frequency of such sleep attacks. Look at any photo of Earth's night sight, and you see the planet lit up like a Christmas decoration. As the glowing lights of bustling cities expand, the serenity of natural darkness wanes. But the repercussions are not just the loss of the starry night sky. Light pollution also affects animals who depend on a nighttime environment to survive. Many bird species use the stars to navigate at night. Baby sea turtles use moonlight reflected off the ocean to guide them back to the water. City lights can confuse them, and fear them off course. Humans are not immune, either. Excessive exposure to artificial light at night can increase the risk of sleep disorders and it's also been linked to obesity, depression, diabetes and even cancer.
Most people think of astronomers as people who spend their time in cold observatories peering through telescopes every night. In fact, a typical astronomer spends most of his or her time analyzing data and may only be at the telescope a few weeks of the year. Some astronomers work on purely theoretical problems and never use a telescope at all. You might not know how rarely images are viewed directly through telescopes. The most common way to observe the skies is to photograph them. The process is very simple. First, a photographic plate is coated with a light-sensitive material. The plate is positioned so that the image received by the telescope is recorded on it. Then the image can be developed, enlarged, and published so that many people can study it. Because most astronomical objects are very remote, the light we receive from them is rather feeble. But by using a telescope as a camera, long-time exposures can be made. In this way, objects can be photographed that are a hundred times too faint to be seen by just looking through a telescope. The history of software is of course very very new. And the whole IT industry is really only 67 years old which is extraordinary and to be so close to the birth of a major new technology, a major new discipline is quite remarkable given where we got to in those 67 years. And the progression has been not so much a progression as a stampede because Moore's Law, the rapid expansion in the power of computing and the rapid fall of the cost of computing and storage and communications has made it feasible for information technology to move into all sorts of areas of life that were never originally envisaged. What has happened is that there has been as I said a stampede for people to pick the low-hanging fruit. And that is what's guided the development of software and information technology over the past decades and continues to do so with a number of consequences that we will explore. Many parents communicate and educate their children with two languages, probably because they both know more than one language, or they come from different countries. Most of these parents think this can benefit their children's language learning. But actually kids will get confused when their parents use different languages from each other to describe the same object. If one parent sticks to one language, and the other one sticks to another language, their children will not be confused anymore.
soot, which comes from combustion of many different things, is black so it's a strong absorber. In fact it's second only to CO2 in terms of warming. So it's actually ahead of methane, which you hear a lot about. The interesting thing about soot and aerosols impact on climate is that their lifetimes are so much shorter. So if we can reduce the soot we can make changes within months versus tens of years. It's not to say we should ignore the CO2 and the greenhouse gases but it could buy us some time while we actually do the right strategies to reduce the greenhouse gases. Uniquely stable, they seem to participate in no chemical reactions. But by understanding the stability of the noble gases, physicists discovered the key to chemical bonding itself. Dmitry Mendeleev added the noble gases to his periodic table in 1902, where he arranged the elements in rows and columns according to their atomic weight. Mendeleev was able to see repeating or periodic patterns in their properties. The noble gases appeared regularly in the periodic table, occurring in every eighth position, at least amongst the lighter elements. A leader can define or clarify goals by issuing a memo or an executive order, an edict or a fatwa or a tweet, by passing a law, barking a command, or presenting an interesting idea in a meeting of colleagues. Leaders can mobilize people's energies in ways that range from subtle, quite persuasive, to the coercive threat or the use of deadly force. Sometimes a characteristic leader, such as Martin Luther King Jr., can define goals and mobilize energies through rhetoric and the power of example. We can think of leadership as a spectrum, in terms of both visibility and the power of the leader wields. On one end of the spectrum, we have the most visible, authoritative leaders like the President of the United States, or the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or a dictator, such as Hitler or Gaddafi. At the opposite end of the spectrum is casual, low-key leadership, found in countless situations every day around the world, leadership that can make a significant difference to the individuals whose lives are touched by it. Over the centuries, the first kind, the out-in-front, authoritative leadership, has generally been exhibited by men. Some men in positions of great authority, including Nelson Mandela, have chosen a strategy of leading from behind. More often, however, top leaders have been quite visible in their exercise of power. Women, as well as some men, have provided casual, low-key leadership behind the scenes. But this pattern has been changing as more women have taken up opportunities for visible, authoritative leadership.
In our survey, over 100 CEOs who had recently been through an acquisition or merger were asked which areas of their activities needed the most effort. Uh, as you can see, the most frequent response to this question was that information technology requires the most integration effort. According to 58% of those we surveyed, IT was the most time-consuming and needed the most work. This is understandable as many of the IT issues are extremely complex and the consequences of any change in IT can have a significant impact. The key is how quickly and effectively IT integration can be achieved. And there has to be a clear understanding of the consequences there may be of not getting it right. The two other areas requiring significant attention, sales, marketing and business development on the one hand, and financial management on the other, both were selected by 49% of the respondents. Wilson came then from a different world, and he became the focal point of a broad mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense, and certainly some of them, like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner, were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people, but this was a world before the division between the brows or between elite or whatever had established itself as part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life an innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with an openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much a part <coughs> of life for everyone as conversation. He thought that Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and help that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost 50 years, he was a dedicated, a literary journalist, an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper. Absolutely. There's a lot of interest in what forms those clouds. Why are those clouds there? Why do they stick around? At the center of every cloud drop is a particle. You can't grow a cloud drop without having a particle there for the water to condense on. The key questions that people have not directly addressed until very recently is what actually forms those clouds. 
and so the ones that you're looking at over the ocean. It turns out sea salt is a very effective nucleator for forming clouds. So there's a really good chance that those are loaded with sea salt. But as you go inland, you start to have pollution come from all different kinds of sources. And so different sources form clouds more effectively than others. And we're trying to unravel which sources are actually contributing to the clouds. The clouds are incredibly important players in climate change and that they reflect the light back to space. And so they're keeping things much, much cooler than they would be if they weren't there. They also play a huge role in regional weather. So we're actually starting to see shifts where having more pollution input into the clouds is affecting weather patterns. And in particular, it's actually reducing the amount of precipitation. So we're starting to see drought in areas with super high levels of air pollution. So, we were founded just over ten years ago, when I was in the Royal Academy, a museum in the centre of London, with my three children, at the Aztec exhibition. I don't know if any of you saw it. I had an older child and two younger children, twins, strapped in a pushchair, and one of my children, three years old, shouted and I've never denied he shouted he shouted, monster, monster. At this statue which looked just like a monster, had snakes for hair, a big beak for a nose. And, I thought, this is fantastic. I've got a three-year-old that's appreciating art. How good can it get? So, I bent down and I said, yes, it looks just like a monster, and, at that moment, a room warden came over, a gallery assistant came over and said we were being too noisy, and threw us out to the wrong family. I was, at that time, a journalist with The Guardian newspaper, and two days later wrote a big piece in The Guardian about being thrown out of the Royal Academy. What was really interesting was, by the end of that day, we had had, at the paper, over 500 emails from other families saying, museums aren't working for us. Let's try and make it work. So, that's what we did. In The Guardian, we set up a campaign. We called it the Kids in Museums campaign, but it didn't really exist. It was just a few pages. We ran loads of stories on it, I began touring the country talking about how to make your museum family friendly. Here are three important factors in creativity. People, process, and product. The most important one is the process. First, you have to create the right person through education with a creative mind. Second, you have to create the right process to have people engaged in the innovation process. Third, you need to find the right problem to work on. Human beings can survive and prosper largely depending on the creativity they have. If you identify and assess the creativity of a finished product, it is taken as a proxy for the creativity of the person who produced such 
a product. Therefore, a creative product should be surprising, original, beautiful and useful. People should have factors necessary for genius, ability and the right mindset. You should improve to imitate and change insight. Look from new perspectives. Innovately create something with imagination to expand the conceptual spaces. I've been thinking a lot about the world recently and how it's changed over the last 20, 30, 40 years. 20 or 30 years ago, if a chicken caught a cold and sneezed and died in a remote village in East Asia, it would have been a tragedy for the chicken and its closest relatives, but I don't think there was much possibility of us fearing a global pandemic and the deaths of millions. 20 or 30 years ago, if a bank in North America lent too much money to some people who couldn't afford to pay it back and the bank went bust, that was bad for the lender and bad for the borrower, but we didn't imagine it would bring the global economic system to its knees for nearly a decade. This is globalization. This is the miracle that has enabled us to transship our bodies and our minds and our words and our pictures and our ideas and our teaching and our learning around the planet ever faster and ever cheaper. It's brought a lot of bad stuff like the stuff that I just described, but it's also brought a lot of good stuff. A lot of us are not aware of the extraordinary successes of the Millennium Development Goals, several of which have achieved their targets long before the due date. That proves that this species of humanity is capable of achieving extraordinary progress if it really acts together and it really tries hard. The sound of a cracking knee isn't particularly pleasant. But it gets worse when you listen up close. Knee cracking recording, it does for most people. But for me, it actually just makes me excited, Omer Inan, an electrical engineer at Georgia Tech. I actually feel like there's some real information in them that can be exploited for the purposes of helping people with rehab. Inan's experience with cracking knees goes back to his days as an undergrad at Stanford, where he threw discus. If I had a really hard workout, then the next day, of course, I'd be sore, but I'd also sometimes feel this catching or popping or creaking every now and then in my knee. A few years later, he found himself building tiny microphones at a high-end audio company. So when he got to Georgia Tech and heard the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, wanted better tech for knee injuries, he thought, knee cracking recording why not strap tiny microphones to people's knees, to eavesdrop as their legs bend? What we think it is, is the cartilage and bone rubbing against each other, the surfaces inside the knee rubbing against each other, during those movements. He and a team of physiologists and engineers built a prototype with stretchy athletic tape and a few tiny MICS and skin sensors. And preliminary tests on athletes suggest the squishy sounds the device picks up are more erratic, and more irregular, in an injured knee than in a healthy one. 
which Inan says might allow patients and doctors to track healing after surgery. Details appear in the IEEE transactions on biomedical engineering. The primary application we're targeting at first is to give people a decision aid during rehabilitation, following an acute knee injury, to help them understand when they can perform particular activities, and when they can move to different intensities of particular activities. A useful thing to take a crack at. Why should we bother studying animal behavior? Well, first and foremost, because we are interested in understanding why animals do what they do. There are lots of other reasons for studying animal behavior. Conservation biologists need to know what animals do if they're going to save them. Are those animals social or solitary? How much space do they need and how many mates do they have? Sometimes you can't predict the outcome of the research. Fernando Notterbaum started out being interested in how birds know what to sing. Yet his research eventually led to a complete overhaul of the entire field of neurobiology, a totally unanticipated yet utterly monumental effect. And this is the course textbook by John Alcock. The fact that this is in its ninth edition tells you how fast and afield animal behavior is. There are lots of new developments. The impact on young Australians who are interested in buying a home of their own has been very significant. Australia's housing affordability now shapes the typical housing cycle or housing career as some people call it. Most Australians in the normal course of events are people who move through the housing cycle in a way that matches the stages of life that they're at. So, they move out of the family home in their late teens or early twenties as they gain their independence from their families, then they rent save for a home they can afford as either a group, or maybe a couple. And maybe they can upgrade it when they have a family in their middle age, they are more than likely to have paid off their mortgage. And that means they have housing security in their old age. That's no longer the typical housing cycle for Australians, young people generally live at home for much longer than they once did. They generally rent for longer and they're more likely to be saddled with a mortgage not just into their middle age but more often than not into their retirement as well. In fact, in 2006, 65,000 retiree households were still paying off the mortgage. Affordable rent is also an elusive right around Australia. We have very low rental vacancies, we see high turnover as landlords want to maximize their profits in tight market, and we see less long-term or lifelong rental, as we see in other countries and other economies.
Happiness comes from frequency and quality of social relation. The higher the frequency is, the more happiness relations with friends and family and others produce. It is not sure why social relation is correlated with happiness. But there's evidence that when people feel more satisfied with their social relations, they will feel happier. In turn, when people feel happier, they will get more satisfied with social relations. Happy people tend to be social more with friends and have more interaction between family. Some people wonder if their social activities make them happier or their happy personalities drive them to be social more with their friends and families. But Aristotle says the reason we need rhetoric is we have to be able to use it. To use rhetoric influence the ramble, we try to get them to understand truth. Truth as suggest, is different than xx rhetoric is the dressing, is the body, right? Truth as the spirit, is the soul, is abstract. It doesn't have a body. It's not particular. If you want to get somebody to the truth, you might have to use some kind of tricks. Right? Because most of people are not sound and can see the truth. That's what we think. Most people are rambles. Really. Only the educated be erudite are actually capable of seeing the truth. If you want to get the general mass there, you may have to do a little bit. So Aristotle that is rhetoric. Rhetoric is something that is used to influence people. Right? And it's a kind of mentally promised a logic. Let's say if I'm asking which source do you often use to get information? Newspaper? Radio? And the survey shows 62% of the people chose Internet. You might be thinking I am going to say, how important the Internet is, or how quickly it has changed the world for a few years. But what if I tell you this survey is conducted on the website globalandmail.com? Our answer will be different. Because the people who did this survey on a website must be frequent users of Internet. This sample is a biased sample. So we have to pay attention to how a survey is conducted. I think with our linguistic training we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. 
It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognize that the communities have to be the authority in their language. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of our training we do, have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place, so in a sense the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. The comics I show you with lots of people chatting around in a room is a form of description. We use different kinds of methods to describe a situation. Sometimes we have to use visual description, particularly when we do not witness the scenario. I was born during the Second World War and my hometown is X. For example when I asked my mother about the war, I always ask her you have mentioned this or that when you talk to me when asked her about the shelter, I asked her what the shelter looks like and when did you go to the shelter. From her response I could get more visual evidence as I can to write my book. Sometimes it's the little things that can make big things happen. Fleas and the plague, atoms and nuclear bombs. Diminutive leaders in world history. Soot is one of these little things. Soot also known as black carbon is released when you burn dung, coal, diesel fuel and wood. From Los Angeles to Mumbai, soot causes respiratory illnesses like lung cancer and asthma and contributes to 1.6 million premature deaths every year. Mostly among the poor. And it gets worse. Atmospheric currents carry soot thousands of miles from where it is produced, to the Himalayas and the Arctic. Black carbon being black, absorbs sunlight, so even a little soot on snow makes it melt faster. And when snow melts global sea levels rise, threatening our freshwater indigenous communities and polar bears who hunt on the Arctic ice. Climate change has been a big thing for a while and carbon dioxide has been its main cause. Scientists estimate that soot causes 25% of human-caused global warming. It's the second leading cause of Arctic warming after carbon dioxide. Let's not underestimate the impact of this tiny particle. But there's good news, reducing black carbon may be the fastest way to slow global warming. Buy time for the Arctic. Yes even more so than changing a light bulb. Since black carbon only stays in the atmosphere for a couple of weeks, reducing it will produce results immediately. Of course, reducing soot alone won't solve global warming, but solving our soot problem now will help buy time for the Arctic and allow us to deal with the bigger problem of carbon dioxide. 
We have the cleaner industries, cook stoves, and diesel now we have to use them. In developed nations, we've significantly reduced our black carbon, but we still have much more to do. We need to tighten our standards at home and invest in cleaner technologies in developing nations. In a world going on 7 billion people, you might feel rather little yourself. But if you urge the U.S. government and the European Union to take the lead on black carbon reduction, you can make a big difference. Subscribe our channel to get weekly and monthly PTA exam predictions, according to your exam date. Please like, comment and share this video. Your appreciation is biggest motivation for us. See you in next video.